There we go. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the fun office hours for June 2023. Uh, on the agenda today, we've got an announcement about the first fun training session. Uh, that's going to be hosted in July, and I'll give you some details here in a minute. And then I've got a presentation that I gave a few years ago at FortranCon 2020 that I'm gonna kind of that I've updated a little bit, and I'll go through that one about uh, the Fortran Package Manager (FPM). And then we'll just kind of have some time for open discussions. So uh, let me start by saying sharing my screen and showing what we've got going for the first fun training. So we've gone ahead and scheduled the first fun training session for July 2023. That's going to be July 10th and 11th at 9 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. So basically two half-day events uh, where we're going to be covering uh, basics of modern Fortran. And I'm going to go over this kind of with an eye towards updating legacy code, if you will. So kind of from the perspective of here's code you may have received from somebody or, you know, come, come on to a project late or something like that, that that's been written long time ago and uses kind of old practices. So here's some examples of some old practices that you might see, and here's what the modern equivalents might look like in Fortran, and some reasoning behind maybe why you would want to use the modern equivalents instead of the old styles. Uh, the, the full agenda is still a little bit of work in progress, but I've been working on it this morning, so I'll give you a, a brief preview of what that's going to look like, uh, and I will wholly welcome any suggestions or feedback for specific topics that you'd like to see covered as part of the tutorial. Right? We, we want to make this as helpful for you all as possible. So uh, of course we'll have a welcome and introduction. I'll talk briefly about you know what are some of the advantages of modern Fortran. Uh, hopefully we'll have enough uh, material for you all to be set up with either training accounts or have an account already on Perlmutter or at the very least be able to run some of the examples on your local machine uh, but we'll give a couple of minutes just to make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page there uh, and then the first topic that I like to go over when I'm trying to teach modern Fortran or just Fortran in general is what are the compiler error messages you're going to see, what do those look like, and what kind of things do they indicate? Because that is almost always the kind of thing you're always going to encounter. Like, I still, to this day, encounter compiler error messages all the time, and it's very helpful to know how to interpret them to kind of point you in the right direction in order to start making fixes to your code. Um, We'll talk a little bit about uh, what modern declarations and control constructs. Like, you know, you, you might have seen some old style where maybe there aren't even any declarations at all because it's using implicit typing, or you know, some old styles of how you might declare what would have been constants, or you know, some, some things like that. We'll, we'll go over some of that stuff. And what are the modern equivalents? Maybe like, how do I get rid of go tos? <laughs> um, so, so that'll kind of spill over into day, into the second half of day one. Uh, we'll start talking about modules and sub modules and submodules. Um, what's the benefits to using modules? What's then some of the benefits of making use of submodules? Some things like that. Um, by day two, we'll start talking about derived types, uh, and hopefully start getting into a little bit of parallel programming in modern Fortran with co-arrays. Then by the end of the day on, on uh, day two, uh, we might have some time to start getting into using the Fortran package manager and maybe start talking a little bit about uh, unit testing practices. 
So that's kind of the, the work in progress agenda for what that training session is going to look like. But I, as I said, I definitely am going to take suggestions. If you have any particular topic you'd like to see covered, we can try and make sure we fit it in. So with that, I will take a brief pause and see if anybody has questions, suggestions, et cetera, for, those, for any of those things. I, um, this is just Koichi. Uh, I don't have any suggestions, but this is just looks really, really great to me. But something I really wanted to have, you know, as a model user, flash developer, short modifier without official Fortran training. I do have a few textbooks, but I really read through all the textbooks myself. And uh, so, it's really, really good, and I uh, try to advertise this training in uh, mm -hmm. division as well. So thank you very much. Uh, if I come up with suggestions, I will shout and I'll send you. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and, thank you. And as soon as we start to get a lot more of the logistics worked out and some of the details nailed down, we'll start sending out uh, ad advertisements, uh, announcements, and uh, all of that fun stuff. Great. All right, well then, we'll get started on the presentation I pulled up to try and fill up some time here. So this is from a presentation that I gave a few years ago in at the Fortran Con 2020 about the Fortran Package Manager. So uh, what is the Fortran Package Manager? What, what's it for? So what, are, what are the problems that a package manager tries to solve? Um, how does FPM solve those problems? I'll give you kind of a live demo real quick uh, for any of, the, any of you who aren't familiar with it, haven't seen it in action, haven't tried it out. I'll kind of give you a feel for what's that like. Uh, I got a couple of bullet points about what the future development of FPM looks like, and then have time for questions. So what are the problems that a package manager tries to solve? Uh, basically, if I want to use somebody else's library, how do I manage the dependence on that library? And especially as you know, open source software has really kind of proliferated over the last 5, 10, 15 years. You know, there's, there's lots of open source libraries out there that are really good, really useful, and it'd be nice if it was easy to just use them. But then at the same time, how do I manage the fact that I depend on them? Up until we ended up, we got a Fortran package manager, the way a I saw a lot of people dealing with, I depend on this library in Fortran was, I copy pasted the source code of that library into my project. And I have my own now completely bifurcated copy of that, that dependency. And that, that has its pluses and minuses, but you know, it, it'd be nice to have a more convenient way of doing something like that. Another thing that a package manager often can do is act as your build system. There are a lot of, other programming languages, modern programming languages, where that is the case, where the package manager is the whole build system. Uh, they can also work as automated testers, so kind of integrates with a testing framework or something along those lines to help run your automated tests for you. Uh, or if you want to start a new project, they can make that process a lot easier. And then finding available libraries, like there's a big open source world out there. How do I find a library that I might be interested in trying to use? Often they can help with that aspect as well. So we'll, we'll kind of look at some of those. So how does FPM solve those particular problems? Managing dependencies. There's really only a few pieces of information that you really ought to need once you want to depend on some library and make use of it. You need to know what's the name of it, where do I find it, and what version do I need. Those handful of things should be all that is really necessary 
to say, hey, I'd like to use that library in my project. And with FPM, it really is that simple. Let's say, I, there's, a, there's an fpm.toml file that is the configuration file for your project. You need square brackets dependencies. So it's, it's, it is a toml syntax, which is a kind of standardized syntax for, for configuration files. So those square brackets dependencies, and then name of a package equals git equals where, what is the git repository for it? And then there's a couple of other options for saying, I, I want this particular version. And then you can make use of everything that that library provides without having to do anything special. What about building? FPM build. It takes care of, goes and fetches the dependencies for you, scans your source files, and builds them in the right order. Um, so all of the use statements and module statements in your source code, it can kind of look at all of those and go, this is the order that I need to build your source files so that all the module dependencies are respected. So it kind of does that, all of that part automatically for you. So no longer manually maintaining make files. What about testing? Uh, there, there's an equivalent for FPM run, but the, the basic idea is a main program that is found in the test folder is automatically compiled and run when you type FPM test. The same thing is true of an app folder for FPM run. Um, and so by default, it's uh, relatively straightforward, but as you start to add more test programs or more application programs, uh, there, you can specify a lot more of this stuff in the fpm.toml file. Um, what if I'm starting a new project? Uh, it's as simple as type fpm new and the name for your project. So, and then you can tell it that I also want to make sure that it's got an application. I want to have a, a test generated for me and uh, the default is I believe just the library, so it will just create a source file. Um, and so if you start to specify these, th these are the options that you spec pass when you wanna say FPM new. And we'll go through this example here in a minute. But it will create a basic project that has a pretty bare bones FPM.toml file, a module with a single subroutine that just prints hello world basically. Uh, and then optionally, it will provide a program. So if you specify the app uh, flag, it will create a program that calls that subroutine. And then uh, if you specify test, it will create a, a test file that is just a main program that just prints, puts some tests in here. Finding libraries. This one is still kind of a work in progress at this stage. There. There is a plugin that goes and looks at a sort of registry of packages available. So you can do something like FPM search, um, but it's kind of not quite official yet. And we're, we're still kind of working on the last phases of setting up an official repository registry. And once that's done, this, this functionality will be kind of integrated into FPM. So it, this is kind of a coming soon thing. But the idea will be that you can just type FPM search and it will go look at the official registry and show you packages that have names that look something like that and or descriptions of their project that, that contain that word, you know, so, some things like that, your, your basic search functionality. So demo time. Hopefully everything goes smoothly. I went through this a little bit ago, so hopefully everything goes smoothly. So we're going to start with brand new project. Um, so I've just got uh, a folder here. I'm at. Yes, William. Can you make the font a little bit bigger? I, I mean... can. Say when. Yes, that's good enough. Uh, okay. Just make sure that it's not too tiny for uh, recording yeah. stuff. Yeah. No, I I appreciate appreciate the thought. At some point, I mean. 
Hopefully it's not too big either, but we'll get, we'll see what happens. Anyway, uh, so we want to create a new project. I'm just going to name it fun because that's what we're, that's what we're doing here. Uh, and I'm going to say, I want an application. I want library and I want some tests and that will make a directory to put that project in for me. Uh, make the source app and test directories for me and it's going to put those files in there for me. Uh, it initializes it as a git repository for me and it grabs a handful of bits of information from my my global git configuration that it's going to populate the the fpm.toml file. I'll show you that here in a second. Uh, but from there I can cd into that directory and just go ahead and type fpm run and builds the project and says, hello, fun, right? So the goal at this state for something like FPM new is I want the, and no, I haven't started a project to, I've got at least hello world working to be as simple and short as possible. It is, for, for a lot of new programming languages, that really is a test of, how well is your language designed and supported by the ecosystem and tooling is how quickly can I go from I've never even heard of your language to I've written a working hello world program. This kind of puts Fortran back into the, okay, yeah, you can get this done in a matter of minutes, right? I got, got a copy of FPM, make sure you've got a Fortran compiler, type a few commands and you've got a working hello world, right? That, that's the goal. So what exactly did FPM new do for us? Let's open up an editor and take a look. So the fpm.toml file. So it's got the name of the project, a version, um, a, a placeholder for where you can decide what your license is going to be. If you know it's, it's going to be open source, you should pick some uh, open source license that you're fond of. My favorite is generally MIT, but you can also use the Berkeley BSD license. There's a handful of others. GPL is a common one. Apache is a, a pretty common one. So uh, you, you should pick one before you, you know, release it as open source so you can tell your users, you know, what, what, are, the, what are the restrictions on this open source project. Um, this build is Generally, you don't really need this. These are basically the defaults, and so you don't really need this, but if you're wanting to tweak some things, uh, it goes ahead and fills them in there for you, just so you know that they're available in there. Um, install, again, this is the default, so you don't really need it in there, but it, it goes ahead and populates it for you. Um, this one is... The Fortran, the open source Fortran community really is wanting to move in the direction of modern Fortran by default and nudging people into using Fortran safely by default. And so in a recent release, it start, we started supporting this, this block in your toml file and the defaults being I'm going to, depending on which compiler you're, going to, you're using, I'm going to figure out what the flags are to turn off implicit typing and turn off implicit interfaces and default that to it just being free form source, form, source format. So um, these are ones with like legacy projects, you're probably going to want to go change these. So uh, just just be aware that if you're trying to transition a legacy project that still has fixed format, might still be using some implicit typing or implicit interfaces. You might inadvertently see you, your compiler yell at you about those things. Uh, you can just go change these and it'll, it'll go back to normal legacy style. Um, the other thing, I created a library for us, right? So modern Fortran says put put all of your things in modules. So it created a module for us and just a 
kind of a placeholder or something to go in there, a subroutine that just says, just prints hello, hello fun. Um, and then we told it we wanted an application, so it creates a main program for us in the app folder that uses our library and calls that procedure. That's, that's what we get, hello fun. And lastly, it does create a kind of empty test for us so that FPM test does in fact work. Put some tests in here. And one thing you'll notice is I didn't have to explicitly type FPM build. That's kind of always implied when you run, when you do FPM test or FPM run, or there's also an FPM install command, it will invoke FPM build for you and make sure your project's up to date before it goes ahead and does the next thing. Uh, so the next step is going to be, I'd, I'd like to start adding some functionality and I want to make use of a, an existing open source library. So what do, what does it look like to start adding dependencies? to your project. I've already done some of this. So basically, you add this section. I'm going to be using a library, ISO varying string. It, it basically provides a, a wrapper around a varying length string. That's the idea. Uh, so I say, where is it? And what is the version I'd like? I'm up to 3.0.4. Then we can add dependency fun update add a new function so we can use the module and a couple of things I need from there add a new function that has a functionality that makes use of that new new module. And then update our program so that now it's it's also using that new module and the new function that we just wrote. So now we can say fpm run, and it will go and fetch that new dependency, build it, link it into my project, and now I basically have what is the same fun what was the same functionality right it still prints hello fun but now now it's do using uh, a library to to make use of that then we talked a little bit about tests we've got an empty test so if we're using best practices we should write some real tests again i have uh, already taken the liberty of doing a little bit of that. So uh, FPM supports this dev dependencies. So this is just like dependencies, but dependencies are transitive, right? If I depend on a library that depends on another library, et cetera, like it's gonna go down that tree and get all of those dependencies. If you put something in dev dependencies, it says that users of your library won't need this. So it won't it won't continue walking down the dependency tree for those dependencies, right? So if you were going to depend on the fun library that we're writing here, you don't need to depend on whatever testing framework I happen to be using. You just need the things that I directly depend on for the functionality of the library, and so that's what, that's why it's in this different section. But it it functions exactly the same way. And you need the name of the library, where is it, and what version. So we're going to use Veggies, my testing framework. Then we've got a couple of new things from the test. So greeting goes in test, and add test main goes in test, and we can remove the check the original check. So I've written a test that says uh, create greeting, says hello, 
we assert that when we call that greeting function, we find it just says hello fun, right? Uh, and then the the main program there is uh, or the main the main program for the test is generated. I can generate with a tool that I've got that works with veggies to just generate this main program for me. Uh, but it, it basically just runs the tests. So then we can say FPM test. Again, it goes and fetches the new dependency that I've got. Veggies has another dependency that it that it needs. Uh, so transitively, it says, oh, veggies also depends on this other thing. So it goes and gets that as well. Builds the veggies test suite framework, links it in, runs my tests, and says all of my tests pass. So in a matter of you know five to ten minutes, if I mean if if you're you know familiar enough with how all this works, you can go from I don't have a project to I have something that has tests and dependencies and all just works with with FPM. So back to our slideshow. Um, future development. Like I said, uh, there is a centralized registry in progress. Uh, we got the Fortran Lang organization got funding from the Sovereign Technology Fund uh, at, towards the end of last year. They got funding specifically to develop the centralized repository. And so the, the prototype repository is up and currently being tested. And some of the functionality to interact with it has been added to FPM, but it's just not officially done yet. So, but we're real close. Um, User-defined profiles. So FPM has a default set of compiler flags that it uses. It looks those up based on the name of the compiler. But if you want to use something else, you kind of have to manually specify them on the command line when you type FPM. We a couple of years ago, we got funding from Google Summer of Code to have a student add the functionality so that you could put a set of compiler flags and a name into the TOML file so that you, you didn't have to remember them all the time for your project. Uh, that was mostly completed, but it had a few things that needed uh, to be kind of wrapped up before it was merged back into the official, into the main branch. And so it just needs a final push from somebody at some point to get added back in. Um, also, as we start to, as more people start to try and migrate into using FPM, there's a lot of existing packages that use things like MPI, NetCDF, HDF5, Laplaque, etc., that are generally expected to be installed on the system. And we want to kind of support those as somewhat meta packages. So like FPM knows it's supposed to go find where that package is on your system and add it to the add the correct path to the link command so that it all gets linked in correctly. And so there's a little bit of work being done on how we can support that a little bit nicer. And you can find the official repository at github.com slash Fortran Lang slash FPM. And if you have any questions, you can always email me, brad at ldl.gov. Um, so any questions on FPM? And when I post the recording of this, I'll also post a link to the original recording. Uh, the original slides are available on a repository on, under Fortran Lang as well. Uh, there's a couple of other resources I can point you at too. So, uh, I can I can give additional resources if you're interested in those. Are there any questions? Let me stop sharing so I can see the chat. Uh, I e so Damien, what was your from the perspective of software archaeology? Oh, earlier, early on, you mentioned that we were uh, that you had a lot of experience working with old codes, and you were oh yeah you teach it from the perspective of modernizing a code. So. Oh yeah, the 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 training yeah. session will will teach it kind of that way. Yep. And then Kate 
suggested that we uh, do a quick introduction again, so we will get to that here in a minute. But Manuel does seem to have a question. Go ahead. Hello, Brad. I'm good to hear you. I'm connecting from mm -hmm. the phone, so not able to connect the camera today. Uh, thank you for the demo. It's really great if you want mm -hmm. to start building a Fortran project from scratch. So being able to build, run, compile, test, install, so create functionality. But what happens if I already have a project? You talk about modernizing legacy code or existing projects. Mm -hmm. And the existing project doesn't fit into this great structure, predefined mm -hmm. structure of subfolders, SLC, test, whatever. Mm -hmm. Is there any recommended way to, from a project and not a structure this way, to start using FPM without, without mm -hmm. having to change all the organization? Yeah, so a lot of modern projects have a organization that may not use exactly the same name or exactly the same structure, but it's still kind of compatible. And so FPM supports ways of telling you what are the folder names that matter in terms of, you know, where's your main program. And, and a lot of your source can, can, can just be in the main, in the same folder with the main program. Like if you're not trying to write a library that is going to be usable by other people, then you don't have to have a source folder. Everything could be an app. And like I said, you can tell FPM that your app folder isn't named app, it's named other thing. And so, so there's a, just enough functionality that a lot of time it's just a matter of write the right FPM.toml file and it will just work because okay. all of those options are, are configurable. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jacob. Hey, Brad. Thanks for the presentation. Um, oh. I have uh, my big question. I have several questions, but what my big one is, uh, you know, tools like uh, SPAC and CMake, where SPAC is the, the package manager and CMake mm -hmm. is, the, is the build system and the test system. You know, those are pretty, I think, common tools. And do mm -hmm. you, you see FPM as an in addition to those tools, or is it a wholesale replacement? Can can they be used side by side, where FPM manages, say, Fortran dependencies and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, otherwise, um, so dependencies might be managed. Man so spec is spec is a somewhat orthogonal approach to dependency management in that it wants to build shared libraries and manage what's installed on the system. Whereas FPM is more about managing source code dependencies slightly, right? So you're just going to build an executable and just kind of, it's for the most part going to end up being statically linked and you're just going to distribute an executable. That's kind of what FPM expect, expects by default. But there's been talk about how do we integrate with something like SPAC? So because SPAC wants to dictate, here's the compiler I want you to use because that's what's installed on the system. Here are these other shared libraries that your project might want to link to. It, it's going to, you know, tell you where to find them because this is, you know, based on all the dependency management that it does. Uh, so there's definitely been talk about how do we interact with that nicely. Almost, and there's also been talk about could FPM generate a CMake file? Right? So like, if you do want to distribute with SPAC, or something else, or somebody else wants to use CMake as their build system and they want to depend on your library, could FPM make it really easy for you to just generate a CMake file that then they can use? And so those are those are ideas that have been suggested and there's some interest in them. We just need somebody who's willing to go develop it and add it. But, yeah. So the second question, uh, it, 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 you know, when you do a test, how does the test fail? How does FPM expect a test to fail? Does it look for a seg fault or does it expect a certain string or something like that? Um, it looks at the exit code for the program. The exit code. So it's, it's pretty right. so, so if you have a non-zero exit code, it goes, oh, your test failed. Okay. And then the last question is, um, how, how do you determine the source files? I saw I saw you didn't have a source file list. Do you just glob everything in the directory with an F90 uh, uh, extension or is that? For the most part, yeah. Um, so, and, and this comes back to some things that I didn't uh, didn't mention. One is FPM is written in Fortran. <laughs> so if you know Fortran and are interested in contributing, it's written in Fortran. 
please go feel free to help contribute. Uh, the other is it actually also works with C and C++. If you've got C and C++ code in your project, it will pick that up, compile it with GCC or you know the equivalent C. The Fortran standard calls it the companion C processor, right? But it will you know look up you know you're using G Fortran, so I'm supposed to compile C with GCC and C++ with G++, right? So everything links together correctly. Um, but yeah, basically it just goes, you said that your sources were in SRC, or by default, it, that's where it looks. Uh, so anything that's in there with .f or .f90 or et cetera, that's Fortran. If it's a .c, that's C code. If it's .cpp or the handful of other extensions that are usable for C++, C++ that's C++. Uh, we'll just compile that. It does. It parses the Fortran enough to see what modules are in a given source file and what modules do a given source file use, so that it can order that mm -hmm. that compile. Yeah. So it has to do the dependency tree. <laughs> yeah. It it and does. It does that with Fortran. That's impressive. Yep. But it, it yeah. does it automatically, so you don't have to manually type all that out and maintain a make file and make sure that your make file stays up to date if you change a use statement or something like that. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. William? I'd like to add the, uh, the two limiting, um, the two limiters that uh, uh, blocks the current uh, support for SPAC in FPM is um, how to produce shared libraries and how mm -hmm. to locate external dependencies from spec mm -hmm. uh, just referencing the issue that's currently open in uh, still open in the fpm uh, repo right like, so that's like two limitations that we have to solve first before we can uh, start integrating uh, fpm with spec mm -hmm. so right uh, so it, it yes. to a degree that would kind of change the way that fpm wants to work right like if, if FPM is not the dependency manager, then it should be able to talk cool. to the other dependency manager, in this case, spec, for instance. Right, but it's a weird way, of, it's a weird, weird aspect of it. That, like, you specified your dependencies to FPM, and then you told it not to look at those dependencies, not, or not to go get the dependencies for you, right? So that's a but weird- in the system, yes. Right, but that's that's assuming so that, that, um, that yeah. that's assuming that SPAC agrees with what versions of the dependencies you want to use, right? So if there's a conflict there, like <laughs> how does FPM say to SPAC, "Hey, no, the the project told me they wanted version 1.1, and you told me that you're using 1.02, and those don't work to get like you end up with this." Uh, yes. You, you've got so, yes, that's the blocker. That's correct. That's the blocker. Right. The other blocker is uh, shared libraries that's usable mm -hmm. by spec. So it's like one way to connect spec to FPM, and the mm -hmm. other way is connecting FPM to spec. So yeah, so yes, I mean, that's the blocker. But the shared the shared library one is relatively straightforward, right? We're already generating static libraries for as. Basically, the way it works is it, it generates a static library for every dependency. And so if you want to generate shared library, it's just run the linker. <laughs> uh, well, On technically, you have to uh, recompile with a PIC uh, flag. Well, I mean. Well, um, we'll continue the discussion later, I mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. um, the second one I want to ask is, what's the status of the meta package? I saw that it will be in uh, FPM09 with uh, MPI and uh, OpenMP, mm -hmm. I think. Right, so 09 has been released. And oh, nice. so I believe the MPI, I haven't, I haven't played with how the meta packages work yet. Mm. Um, but in theory, it's they said that uh, the MPI meta package works. So mm. it's a go play with it and let them know how it works or if it doesn't, right? Right. But the, the basic oh. is just try and figure out what the right path is for the link command. Mm. 
And I'm drafting an issue to extend the OpenMB uh, syntax with OpenMB target, which will be important for GPU usage. Right, but that's irrelevant to FPM. That's correct, but uh, it's just adding a bunch of uh, compiler flags, basically, if it uses OpenMP target in addition to OpenMP, because you need extra special flags. Right, but FPM expects you to tell it what the flags are if you're not using the default right. flags. So right. there's actually no change needed to FPM. Well, it's just nice that if uh, there is a database in FPM, just like the currently there is a database for every OpenMP flag for every compiler that FPM supports. No, there's not. There is not? No. I thought it's in the it compiler. Does, it, uh, it does not use OpenMP by default. The, mm. the default flags are debug symbols and a handful of the common, you know, extra checks. And mm. then release is just what is the optimization flag, mm. basically. Like that, that's basically just it. And so if you want to use OpenMP, you have to, you have to say, oh, also use the OpenMP flag. If I look at the uh, meta package uh, PR, it does include it in the database in inside the. Uh, oh, the, okay. The meta package OpenMP has. Uh, I see. Where it, uh, yeah, I'm looking at right. the FPM compiler uh, file. Uh, it does right. add the OpenMP flags. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that meta package feature is really new. It just released with zero point mm -hmm. nine like mm -hmm. a few days ago. Yep. So that might yeah that might be worth. But at the moment, FPM doesn't look other. It doesn't look at your source code other than module statements and use statements. That's correct. So that would be a new feature to have it try and scan to figure out what features of the language or extensions are you using. And so that'd be a whole new thing. Right. We would welcome any contributions, of course. But <laughs> that's it's not. Almost a big I just need effort. to test. Uh, can I share screen? Uh, I suppose. Uh, I'm just collecting all the different flags um, for uh, the different uh, GPUs, and mm -hmm. I just need to test each and every one for them uh, of them to make sure that it is correct. Mm -hmm. Especially this part, which I'm not too familiar with the Intel uh, stuff. Right, but you have to decide what, when to use them. Yes. So when to use them will be if you uh, open MP equals star and then you add another uh, meta package open MP target equals star or something like that. Could be. Could be. And uh, by the same extension, we can also uh, do the same thing for open ACC, for instance. But mm -hmm. that's a li more limited because as far as I know, only uh, NVIDIA compiler and uh, Cray compiler supports that. GFortran supports to an extent. So just three compiler uh, mm -hmm. tools uh, support open right. AC. Yep. All right. Uh, any other questions or any other discussions on anything else? Oh, OK. Um, uh, Brad, can I ask two questions? This is Kuruchi mm -hmm. again. OK, now. Um, so not really. Ex not much experience in Fortran. So first question is this, the directory structure that if you ever create, like app mm -hmm. and source and test, mm -hmm. I think it is app and source. Is this like a, something standard, modern Fortran, something style that recommended? There and, are a lot of languages started to kind of standardize on this style. So okay, I see. FPM was modeled after Cargo's Rust's cargo and mm -hmm. Haskell's stack, and they kind of expect that same directory structure by default. There's a handful of other languages that do something similar. Their package managers are similar, maybe not exactly the same, but like there's variations on it a little bit, but it's kind of standard practice at this point. And then does it like allow to make even subdirectories under source? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can organize under the source folder however you want. It's just going to go find all of the source files in there, compile them all together, and link them into whatever. Okay. The second question is to, so if I got to develop some, you know, program or some code that eventually I want to run on HPC environment, mm -hmm. like Palmada, I guess the workflow would be 
to you know like project and then use FPM on like an interactive job first on the compute node and pass. Um, that would be one way you could go about it. Uh, so the the head nodes, the logging nodes are there for you to kind of compile and you know right. do some initial setup and stuff like that. So you can run FPM on the on the login nodes, and that's that's perfectly legit. Um, so, but it's when you want to run the application, it's do you want right. to run it interactively or do you want to submit it to the queue system? And the run command does have an extra flag that you can say, put, basically it says put this in front of the name of the executable mm -hmm. when you, when you run it. Oh, I and see. So, and so you can put your S run command mm -hmm. as that option and it will, yeah submit your executable to the queue. Oh, okay. See. Yeah. That's good to know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Didn't know about this. So I'm going to yep. give it a try. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Good deal. You're welcome. Anybody else? Do we want to do a quick uh, go around and do introductions? I, there are a few new faces, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it would be great, especially for us on the Berkeley Lab side. The more we hear about the people that are joining, the more we know um, what types of things we might want to plan in the future. So if if everybody's comfortable with sharing a bit about who you are, where you work, why you're interested in Fortran, why you're interested in this group, um, that would be great. I'll go ahead and uh, stop the recording here too, that way, in case you didn't want to make all that public.